Hello everybody and welcome back to, yes, another episode of the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast with your host, myself as ever, Alex Connor, where we talk everything training, nutrition and lifestyle respectively. And as promised, I'm keeping this now more short, streamlined approaches to the introductions. And first, let's get the plugs out of the way, or should I say not out of the way, because there's a reason why we do the plugs. It's generally because they're good, solid resources and we want to help you and we want to direct you towards better sources so that you can implement them into your life to enhance your results, whatever they may be. So head to my website at fearlesstrainingunited.com. That's where you can um, join my academy, my membership site. That's an online educational resource on hand 24 seven. You can have me in your pocket along with some other very talented practitioners where we teach you everything you need to know about training, nutrition and lifestyle along with everything else in terms of the gray areas like the cooking, the in-betweens, the exercise library, not just how to load a muscle but how to effectively complete your exercises so you can get more out of them and avoid injury going to the shopping store, the grocery store, if you like, for my friends overseas and knowing what to look for, how to read food labels, what food you should get, should avoid, etc. The list goes on. You get me, you get me, right? If not, send me a message and then you get me. (laughs) You can also find out more about my one-on-one coaching if you're in the area. Also, my online coaching, which is all congruent and cross excuse me, crosses over with the Academy and obviously all my other social media platforms, the YouTube vlogs, um, the podcasts, etc. And if you're listening to this, I imagine you found the YouTube channel or the podcast. Okay, so now that's out of the way, uh, let's move on. So I have another talented guest this week and I am in conversation with Mel Davis. Now, Dr. Mel Davis holds a PhD in neurobiology and behavior and has over 10 years of research experience and to give you a bit of a synopsis, just a couple of bullet points to wet the old whistle of the chat. Um, we talked about behavior and habit interventions, real life struggles and communications and, and what that sort of journey looks like in real life. We then cross over and sort of extrapolate that out into real world applications, implementations for nutritional tools, skills and strategies. We talk about her passion and love for BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and any crossovers and correlations in relation to strength training. We obviously cover the biggest misconceptions and mistakes in her space and what she seems to come across within her experience. And we talk a little bit about physique competitors versus in endurance and sporting specific athletes and any training and nutritional benefits we touch base a little bit on that amongst other things the game changers once again sort of made an appearance if you like um that's getting a lot of exposure lately still that has caused quite a ripple we do slay some misconceptions in that space as well however Thank you for listening, guys, as always. I'll ask you for one thing before I go, and that is please, whatever platform you listen to it on, go now. If it is safe to do so and you're not in your car, leave a rating and a review. iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, whatever it might be, Stitcher, all of those media platforms. It takes a second, guys, but it helps the channel grow, and I really appreciate it. So without further ado, enjoy this wide-ranging conversation between myself and Mel Davis. All right, Mel, welcome to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's going to be fun. It will be. It will be. It's going to be a pleasure. Um, So I'm talking from the future. You're talking from the past. It's always going to be good. (laughs) Tell me what's happened. (laughs) (laughs) Right. We've got a chance to uh, rectify the past and perhaps enhance the future. (laughs) So for those listening, prepare yourselves. Let's start off as we always do, Mel. Uh, Give us a bit of a background, a bit of a description about who you are, what you do, and more importantly, why you do it. Sure. Um, My name is Dr. Mel Davis, and I'm a consultant at Renaissance Periodization. Um, I do coaching, writing, editing, a bunch of stuff over there at RP. And the way that I ended up at RP is I was originally a neuroscientist. That's what my PhD is in. And so I love science, I'm interested in the brain, how it works, I'm interested in behavior, 
I'm also an athlete. I'm a black belt in jujitsu. And so I was competing and training all through my PhD and sort of starting to apply my interest in science to my interest in sports. And over time, I steered that into a career at RP and married my two passions. So here I am. <laughs> that is great. And I think um, it, that's something that oh, people always leave out, isn't it? I mean, if you can find something in life that you're passionate about and then that you're good at for the most part because you've got a yeah. <laughs> skill. I wish someone would have taught me that early on. You, you, it's a dangerous combination, I think, for success. And then that's usually where things sort of find traction and alignment. So the a couple of things that we want to impact, uh, unpack today, Mel. The first one, I think, obviously, we'll start appropriately, um, which is more on your like coaching philosophies uh, mm -hmm. and your interest in behavior. Um, can we perhaps go in and, and unpack, and maybe just quickly for the listeners, define you know habits and behaviors, what they are, and why they're so important when we are coaching athletes and communicating to our clients? Right. So I think... Um Habits are something to really think about when you're approaching a new client. We all generally know what our own bad habits are and what we need to work on, but everyone has different sets of habits that get in their way. And habits make up actually most of our behavior. So most of our behavior is automatic and cue-mediated, which is what a habit is. Um, so if you can identify the parts of your behavior that are that, that are automatic, but get in your way, get in the way of you progressing towards your goals, and start working at adapting those and eventually eliminating them, I think that can be a very productive way to um, deal with your own life and your goals and also to help your clients deal with theirs. Mm -hmm. 100%. With, um, with the habits, I remember, I think there's a, there's a couple of good books. I'm sure a lot of the listeners, some of them will be aware of it, like The Power of Habit, etc. And... It was a bit of a hard read, but I come to the end of it and how this is relevant is more the synopsis. And would you agree that they use the analogy of you are a fish in water and you're in a stream and not being able to be aware of your habits or be able to manipulate them is where you are just going with the actual tide. You're going with the stream, you're going with the flow. You're not, yeah, you're not really aware of, um, I guess, all of the social media around you and a lot of the, you know, the advertising and it's subconscious but then having the ability to, you know, adopt and be aware and break and recreate habits gives you the ability to swim upstream. Uh, I, I thought that was a really good analogy and it kind of summed it up. And I was a bit like, why didn't you stay at the start of the book? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much easier, but um, they sort of like laid it on. What are some um, basic things that people can do to start like becoming aware of their habits and, can you maybe break down like the process? Because I think that's some, something that a lot of people get confused about. Like they, they often admit to, yeah, this is a bad habit, but they don't really know how to change it or they think oh, I've just got to substitute it. So perhaps could you give a little bit more, um, I guess, clarity around how someone would approach that? For sure. First, I want to extend that analogy. I haven't actually read that book, but I think you can extend that analogy to being if you're just swimming directly upstream against the tide, that's you using pure willpower to go against your habits and behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if you become a fish who strategizes to, you know, swim quickly when there's a rock blocking the heavy stream or, you know, a uh, draft behind another fish or something so that you aren't pushing as hard to get to the same place. I think that's a good analogy for when you start to change your habits and make it so that you don't need willpower to do all of the things you need to do to get to your goal because there's habits that have become productive instead of unproductive. Um, in terms of how to start, I think the best place to start is when you aren't actually working towards the goal so that you can put sort of more of your focus and energy into becoming aware of the things that you do. So I would say, you know, if you know that you tend to have problems when you diet with like binging when there's an opportunity for sweet desserts or something like that, to start, you know, identifying that, writing down what, what the thought process is, what do you see, how do you react, like, I went to dinner, I wasn't planning on having dessert, even though I'm not dieting, I was just trying to keep it calm, but then, you know, I saw the dessert cart, and I had to have that chocolate cake, and I just ordered it without thinking, just sort of writing down and starting to become aware of what you do is the first step, because you can't really start to alter your behavior until you really know what it is, and a lot of us our habits, we're not very aware of them because they are habits. They're just automatic behavioral responses to certain situations. 
And so something like that, you can start thinking about like, okay, I do love chocolate cake, but I don't have to have it right now. That's not the only chocolate cake in the world. Let's see if I can not order it or I can order it, have a couple bites and pass it to my friend to have something like that where you change the habit, not necessarily eliminate it, but just change it. Like I'll, I'll go for those like impulsive dessert orders less times this week than last, or I'll order them, but eat less of them. So you're not like trying to immediately go from zero to a hundred in the habit change. You're just altering it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh, so creating an awareness, the first step, I think, we often refer to the analogy. I think smoking is a good one um, where we, you know, people go, oh, you know, you can go cold Turkey, which is harder, or you can then try and to eliminate. So you might be smoking 20 cigarettes a day and then going sort of to 15 and 10 or whatever it might be. So from that first step and creating an awareness, um, the next stage is then trying to replace or change, not necessarily eliminate habit. Is that correct? Yeah. I think that it's a, it's a big mistake when people identify a habit that, they want to eliminate and they just try to take it off completely zero to hundred overnight. It's just very unlikely that that'll happen. And very often the stress of trying to make that happen will sort of mentally rebound you into giving up on trying to change the habit. So awareness is the first step. And then another thing to think about is that very often habitual behaviors are sort of compulsive. I don't want to say compulsive, they're automatic responses. So there's something that happens without you thinking about it. But if you become aware enough to stop and think about it, even that pause between whatever cues the behavior and the behavior can be enough to shift the behavior. Because if you, if you break it off during that little like cue, go, then the go isn't as um, strongly uh, stimulated, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, it does. It does. I, and I think we're working with clients that, that first step and going, hey, I, I want you to, you know, Every time you want to say bite your nails or whatever it might be, or every time you want to smoke a cigarette, like you said, write it down or note it down. Sometimes I say to people, you know, write down your phone. Why would you do that? So that's, that's really good. And I'll let you kind of give a bit of context to why that is and what's happening in the brain to kind of break that cue. Is it then just a matter of repeating that process until that habit is then changed or evolved? Yeah. 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 And, cool. I, and I think, um, People understanding something I recommend a lot is that people rather than waiting until they've eliminated the habit to start tracking progress towards a goal, track your progress towards eliminating the habit, right? So if you are someone who binge eats on the weekends, like Friday night, you start and you just don't stop till Sunday. If you have a client that does that, have them start mapping or like graphing how many hours they continued that behavior for once it was initiated and work on making that graph move slowly down so that you get to celebrate wins, even though you're still failing, you're just failing in smaller chunks. Mm -hmm. You still should celebrate that because that's still progress. And I think people don't celebrate any progress until they've perfected their habit and start moving towards a tangible goal like weight loss. And I think it's important to give yourself the, the celebration and recognition of those gradual behavior changes as well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Celebrating the small wins and, and breaking things down into more actionable parts rather than trying to overface yourself. In terms of the clients you work with, what are some of the, the main real life struggles that you see within this realm? And it can be nutrition, it can be training. In terms of habits and behaviors, perhaps give us some real life examples. And what are some strategies and interventions that you've implemented to help people overcome these struggles? Okay. Sure. Um, I think something a lot of us do, all human beings in some realm of life can probably think of an area where we do this. Uh, we kind of are waiting. Sometimes when we're doing something difficult and working towards an excuse or towards a goal, we're waiting for something to give us an excuse to take a break, right? Mm -hmm. Work is hard and doing work for a long time until you get to a goal is really hard. So having a reason to have a day off or an excuse to have a day off happens a lot. And I think rather than sort of scheduling a day off if we need it, we wait for something to happen and be like, oh, I had to go to a work meeting, so I ate five pieces of pizza. And somehow that gets rationalized in our mind. And it's a very human thing to do. So I think that starting to manage, you know, our um, mental capacities for struggle a little bit, like 
okay, after I've been on the diet for four weeks, I know that's when I usually get really antsy and like I'm looking for these excuses. So I'm going to schedule a day where I have like, I do an extra walk in the morning, I get a little dessert at night or something like that to ease that mental stress rather than waiting for an excuse to just blow out the diet and really regress with progress. And I, I hear clients do that a lot on all different levels with sort of training and nutrition. And I think it's something that all humans need to be aware of when they're working towards a goal that there's always a little self-sabotage in us because we want a way to take a break. So I think yeah. that's a common thing and something people have to really be aware of. Mm -hmm. So uh, anticipating the change or anticipating those habits, those behaviors or something that right. might go wrong. Um, whether it's like you said, an athlete where they've got some time coming up that's off or perhaps they know they're going to be in a social scenario. It's like sort of planning ahead, if you will. Yeah. In that yeah. Respect. And yeah. So I address the first part, which is kind of auto regulating, like <laughs> deloads from your sort of stress if you need to, but also like you said, planning ahead. So things like implementation intentions, which are, you saying out loud or writing down on a piece of paper, um, if this happens, I will do this. Stashing protein bars in your glove compartment or your purse or your you know travel bag or whatever it is so that you have emergency backup. Making all your plan Bs and all of your, if this happens, I will contingencies so that you're ready for those obstacles. It's mm -hmm. also the other half of that, that kind of planning, I think. Yeah, great. And I want to dive into the weeds a bit here. And I'm, I'm going to use some examples from my own experience. And I'm going to sort of relay them back onto you. Sure. So for example, some of the things that I've struggled with, or where I've been, you know, challenged as a coach is when I'm sitting down with, with, um, you know, a multitude of different clients over the years. And there's sometimes a little bit of pushback, but also, for example, they're struggling with, hey, you know, they know what to do, we've broken it down. Generally, the first step is creating an awareness, you know, sort of a food diary, looking at someone's habits and behaviors before just giving them a meal plan and, and telling them to hit macros, which I don't think is, is useful for most people. It does have its place, though. Um, when sure. you're, you're, you're with those persons, and again, perhaps we can look at the communication and what this looks like, say, for example, versus an online medium, how you deliver that in an email or whether it's yeah. Skype or Zoom versus the language and what it's like in front of someone. Because again, I think a lot of coaches will struggle with this and you sort of get to that point where it's like, oh, well, you just kind of got to do it. It's like, yeah, but you might be able to do it, but your client can't. Right. So how do you sort of break it down to with somebody? For example, you know, we're starting on these three basic meals. We're looking at a serving of protein. We're looking at 80% whole foods and they're struggling with even that might be a busy work schedule, et cetera. And you could perhaps use some, some real life examples yourself. What are some of the, the tools that you implement? What is, what does the communication kind of look like and how do you walk someone through that process, whether it be breaking it down even further or obviously creating solutions and answers for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think um, something in the fitness industry that we all kind of tend to do is we have this idea of what, you know, a perfect diet and training schedule and contents look like. And we know what can get them the absolute best results. And we become a little bit too rigid about that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, no, you can't just eat two meals a day. That doesn't work. But I think there's a point at which when you're talking to your client and figuring out like, what are the biggest roadblocks for them? There's a point at which we need to be more flexible, even if it goes outside of, you know, our optimal principles for diet. Um, having perfect adherence to a 75% perfect diet is going to be much better than a perfect diet they can't adhere to. So I think as coaches, we have to let go of our idea of optimal for some people for whom life just isn't going to let that happen or they're like level in their fitness journey. It just isn't going to let that happen for them mm -hmm. and finding a way to be flexible and adjust the diet in a way that they can still make pro progress, but actually adhere to it. And then sometimes if it's just a matter of their level in their fitness journey, like they just haven't gotten to the point where they can handle such big changes yet. Sometimes they'll do this sort of suboptimal diet. And then when that becomes habit and comfortable you can start optimizing a bit more you know increasing their meal numbers or increasing their training days or whatever it is yeah no well said i think that that first bit as well where losing what our ideology is of optimal because i know that's something that i struggle with initially in the early years and sometimes still do because it's not about comparing yourself to other people that's a that's a mistake in itself but then going okay well this is where i think you should be but 
going, well, you know what, maybe the client can't do that. Yeah. And then obviously breaking it down further uh, and making these smaller steps. And now I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Now the client sat on the opposite side of the table, so to speak, and they say, well, you know, I, I came to you for weight loss, for strength gain, for lean muscle, and we're not, we're not getting results. But the reason they're not getting results is obviously because that they can't adhere to maybe some basic nutrition. Now, obviously, as a coach and a good coach, we've got to take ownership of that. But something I think is really important and it's left out is setting expectations and, you know, yeah. prefacing what is expected. How do you manage that interaction with a client when perhaps they are feeling a little bit upset because they're not getting to where they need to be, even if they are aware that they need to improve their adherence. Yeah. Again, it's this kind of gray area between like, yes, I do want to help motivate you. And I do think it is a good coach's role to offer some of that. But at some point, the client does have to, you know, come to the party too. Again, what are some of your strategies to, to kind of get around that or, or even, you know, put the client at ease and, and, and improve that adherence? Yeah. So I like to set up expectations early on in the interaction. I often sort of, if they come to me saying, say it's, you know, let's see, can I do this in kilograms? Um, <laughs> 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 anyway, they, they come to you and they want to lose like 1% of their body weight per week for three months. And mm -hmm. that's safe, but that's ambitious, right? So yeah. I usually try to tone down their expectations early on. So I say like, let's, let's set it middle of the road in terms of your goals, because this is going to be harder than you think you're motivated now, but in a month and a half when you've been hungry for all those weeks, it's going to be much harder to keep up that motivation. So let's set, let's set like a moderate goal, moderate ideas. And this is what you'll have to do to get there. But if you find yourself after a month, no problem with any of this and you want to take it up a notch, we can absolutely do that. I've literally never had anyone take it up a notch after a month because usually after a month of hard work, they're like, oh yeah, this, this is hard and I'm making progress. Let's not mess that up. So I think um, starting out with moderate expectations and an understanding that even that is going to be hard is a good way to um, just get them prepared for what, what they're in for basically. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, um, there's kind of another side to that at some point, uh, you got to do the non sugar coated version with your client if they're complaining about a lack of results and really say, like, look, there's no amount of money you can pay me to change the rules of physiology, like, or your genetics or whatever it is. Like, you just have to do more work if you want to see more results. We can strategize ways to get around, like, what's giving you the most trouble. Maybe we can alter the diet a little bit so you still make progress, but we avoid that pit pitfall for you, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I think that's where the, the sort of more hard nose talk, but also let's offer solutions like what's getting in your way and how can we change that? Because what needs to happen is that you work harder to get results. How can we make that happen together? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, sometimes you've got to address the elephant in the room, don't you? And you sort of got to yeah. <laughs> tackle it head on. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, you can dance around the subject and then sometimes it's like, Hey, it is just a, a case of perhaps you putting in as the client a little bit more effort. Yeah. How, um, how do you like to approach? And I know it's individualized with a lot of clients, but generally what is, if we take say, um, a really uh, newcomer client, someone who's at the beginning of whatever you would take on within your scope, what is, from a nutrition standpoint, what does that journey look like? Do you start again with, you know, getting them to do a food diary and tracking that and then sort of getting them onto a meal plan with more structure? Do you track calories? Do you track macros? Do you check in with them weekly? Bit of a big question, but I'd just love to unpack and see kind of the process or perhaps the, the more the, the principles behind what you do rather than the, the elements themselves. Yeah. So I used to take a different approach with this and that was the slowly changing of the diet. But now my preferred way is to leave the diet the same to start, have them start, you know, keeping a food diary, like you said, becoming aware of what they eat when they eat, noting when they're inclined to overeat, things like that. But first goal just to get, if they'll let me do this, some of them are like, no way, we're starting the diet right now. But ideally get them on, you know, a four times a week training program. So they're in the gym four times a week, lifting weights. And the reason I switched it a bit was that 
the slow tweaking of the diet, they don't tend to see much difference. But very often, if they're new to fitness, if you can get them in the gym lifting four times a week, no matter what they're eating, they're going to start to see some physical changes. And those are very motivating. Once the gym is a solid habit, starting to restructure their diet, they're already like feeling good, like they're capable of doing this and starting to change those diet habits becomes a little bit easier because I think adding training several times a week is an easier change than undoing very old bad eating habits. So I think that way provides a little bit better uh, motivation and to drive once they get to the harder part of changing their diet habits. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that was really helpful actually. Um, Again, focusing in on that training, getting the easy wins on the board before perhaps yeah. tackling the more, you know, I think something, a, a statement that is uh, <laughs> versed a lot, I think a lot of people will be nodding their heads to this is nutrition, that's the bit I always find hard. Nutrition, that's yeah. the bit I always fail at or nutrition, enter X in here. Um, it's often a more deep-seated thing. Like some of the nutrition habits are very like emotional and stress-related. So they've got more ties in the brain more cues that are causing them correct and i think that's where you know those habits and behaviors and, and even understanding it and not again i think for coaches listening not trying to work out your scope of practice and this is where i think ongoing education really comes into play but having an understanding of that it is not just as easy as sitting down with someone black and white and going you just need to do this because right. that is not sustainable um and a lot of people will, will not respond to that what are some of the um uh, I don't know if you have your own systems like Excel spreadsheets or you use tracking tools. What are some of the things that you use like mediums to help clients perhaps track their food, create these awarenesses and, you know, get them onto a little bit of structure with their nutrition. Is there any tools that you like to use specifically? Um, so since I'm an RP coach, we have, I have my like personally built templates that I structure for the clients. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything that I use other than I also make sort of individualized tracking sheets for, like I said, how I have them track um, the, you know, decrease in number of hours binging per week. I make a little sheet that spits out a graph so they can see like, oh yeah, I am, you know, I'm doing it less and less. That's great. And I will sort of change that depending on what the client is working on eliminating. Um, but in terms of nutrition, I usually send them a sheet that either has, if they're very new, but we're trying to structure their diet a little bit, it will usually have um, the foods in ounces, like, you know, three ounces of chicken or this many ounces of that without bringing the macros in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll put those in parentheses underneath so they know like this many grams of protein and they sort of start associating those things. If they're really advanced, then I'll give them macros and, you know, meal times and exact amounts, but it's, uh, yeah, it depends. And then if they have very weird schedules, sometimes I'll do three meals a day and a random snack of a certain number of calories disregard macros and just make sure they have the protein and fats they need in the other meals yeah no for sure i think that's where that, that specificity and individuality comes in especially you know as a coach you find your own way you find your own systems and processes to a degree even if it's you know someone's got x spreadsheet over here y spreadsheet it might be the same principles are in there but it's just laid out a bit different based on the way you've put it together um with uh, some of the biggest uh, or challenges that you see with athletes so from what I can ascertain, you know, you work, you have experience with physique athletes, you have experience with um, endurance athletes and dance-based uh, athletes. I mean, please correct me if that's wrong, but could you perhaps talk about the challenges that you get for, uh, with each of those athletes, what the differences are and how you generally overcome them? And if you do work with any more basic sort of, I hate to use the word general population because I think we're all individual, but what's, what the mistakes are made more from an athlete level or a higher level versus, again, more of a beginner level to perhaps break that question down yeah, a little bit better? For sure. I think I kind of think physique is the easiest. It's such a sort of single-minded goal, you know? Yeah. Sports are so much more complex because very often you have, you know, different capacities that you're training depending on the sport. You know, if it's like MMA or CrossFit or something like that, they need to be developing so many athletic capacities during different periods. And most of them are also still worried about their physique. So they have that conflict arising. So I think it becomes a lot more complex with them. 
But I think probably for the more advanced people, the most common problem is overthinking. <laughs> so they've gotten to a point where they're comfortable with the basics and they're trying to hone in on the details and very often they just sort of go off the deep end with overthinking and it becomes huge and stressful and really they don't need to do that much other than maybe like tweak things here and there to optimize um, with general population people who aren't as advanced in their fitness journey let's say I think a bigger problem is just not really understanding the underlying principles so they're confused they easily get um, sort of sucked in by different fads and things they see on the internet and they always want to make sure that what they're doing is actually right and they're unclear and they also tend to have a lot of habits that aren't congruent with their new goals so I think that population tends to have more habit to work on than anything else whereas the advanced population usually just needs to figure out how to calm down and hone in on the specific things they can optimize rather than sort of overthinking foot position for their squat and things like that yeah well said first anyway, world problems anyway, that's the, yeah yeah no I, it has a whole other realm of problems we can step into that in a minute <laughs> yeah no uh, well this is true um, so, so i've heard and i think it's paradoxical a lot of the time isn't it because working with athletes can be um easier uh, it's more linear usually because of like you said they generally have a lot of these tools skills and habits but again yeah. it's what i sort of reference first world problems so, oh you know right, I, right. I can't get this meal in that exact time so oh Right. Like, fine, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but then, yeah, I think more for the general population, there's, there's actually a lot more going on. I would argue to say a lot of the time it can be more challenging yeah. because it's easy to coach someone who's got those skills and habits and is motivated, um, yeah. especially if you have a little bit of experience within that field because you can just really set things up and kind of press go. And a lot of the time, you know, they will just do it. Um, where people who don't really have that education, that structure can be a little bit more challenging over time. Um, in terms of the, now I want to just touch base on the training aspect of it as well. And I want to talk about body recomposition. So persons again, who are, and let's talk more, I guess, beginner style intermediate who are looking at recomposing their body, you know, reducing body fat, increasing lean tissue. What are some of the protocols that you like to see specifically in terms of the ratios between strength training and cardio or conditioning work? Obviously, we're in an industry where we are more pro strength training to obviously recompose our body composition, and we like to manipulate nutrition more for energy balance. Mm -hmm. But how how would you like to implement and use cardio as a tool, and, and what are some of your thoughts and, and parameters around that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I usually start. I don't like to add cardio until a little bit later as a means of avoiding more food cuts. So my general strategy strategy is do you know if they're doing hypertrophy training four times a week maybe they go on a walk a couple days a week and then if they're getting on in the diet and struggling to lose then we start adding I don't like to add a lot of like sprints and hit particularly for non-athletes just because as they're getting tired and weaker from the diet the chances of injury are greater and that just sets you back so far and it's not really worth the extra calories um so I try to add walks. Um, something lately that my husband, who is RP, Dr. James, has been doing, um, thanks to reading about what James Krieger, another sports scientist James, was doing with his athletes based on some really in interesting research. And let me just rewind and start with the research because that sentence dragged on too long and I back to the <laughs> beginning. So the research they did showed that if they put little weights on mice, um, that had the same exposure to food, the mice wearing the weights ate less food, so presumably experienced less hunger, and they lost weight. Um, so James Krieger took that, and he was putting the vests on his physique athletes during their cut, just walk around during the day, extra 10 whatever pounds on your body. You end up burning, your neat just goes up, right? But there also appears to be, and I don't think they've identified mechanism or, you know, conclusively shown this yet but there appears to be an effect of carrying that extra weight on hunger and it appears to reduce your hunger so i haven't actually started implementing that i think i told one client to do it but i think that's a really interesting option and you look dorky so the the client can't be someone who is you know doing presentations in a suit for their job 
every day or that might not go over well. But if it's someone who works in a more casual environment and they can wear a weight vest while they're walking around doing whatever they do in their daily life, that can probably be a really cool way to increase calorie burn, possibly decrease hunger and um, add neat rather than cardio. And it's um, not a very large impact on fatigue either. So I think yeah. that's a really cool new idea. That that was that was a really interesting study. I remember actually James speaking about that one, and I think he worked with I, I forget the bodybuilder, but um, and he's w- world champion. It was IFBB pro, and what they did was they actually kept they took his body weight from the start, and I think they with with this time James they they put a right. weight vest on to maintain to maintain his, the same so, body weight. Yeah, yeah, and the body was like, I'm not changing body weight to a degree, but I am actually decreasing my total body weight. I thought that was really cool. Um, and yeah, from what they've, what we found so far is that, yeah, it decreases, it decreases hunger and it's a really easy yeah. way to offset energy balance. So I think it's yeah, really, using really, that more often. I think it's, yeah, you know, I, I obviously, like you said, it's got to be relevant. I think that's more fine end of the pencil stuff. People have the luxury to do that. Right. Um, but it'd be really, really interesting to see where that research goes and what we find. And I think like more of the mechanism, because like, mm-hmm obviously that's something to do like neurologically in the brain. Why does the brain perceive to be if weight is not changing or we add weight to ourselves, that hunger levels are decreased. Is it placebo? Is it real? Is it, and you know, so I I mean, it would make sense as one of the feedback mechanisms for hunger would be body weight. Mm. It seems totally reasonable to me that that is a, would be a feedback mechanism. It never occurred to me that it would be, but once they did it, I was like, ah, that kind of makes sense. But because we have all kinds of different ways that our bodies look for cues to remain or to stay in homeostasis or which way to shift. So it it makes sense that there would be a bunch of different cues that contribute to things like hunger and uh, metabolism changes and things like that. So, yeah, super interesting stuff. And hopefully we see a lot more sort of um, studies on that and research coming out over the years. And I'm sure we will because people just, you know, want to get more shredded, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, easier, the easier they can make it the more <laughs> the more interested we become so. this is true um such a luxury we have to be able to you know there's people out there trying to solve uh you know hunger and financial crisis and here's us just or an trying to to worry about yeah we're just we're we get. <laughs> trying to get people bigger and stronger um before we digress and take a bit of a left turn though because I'd like to talk to you about your experience in martial arts because I know there's a lot of people who are interested in that and it's kind of becoming more prevalent and there's some really yeah, yeah. cool, I think, principles that, that cross over. Um, I want to ask, um, in terms of when you're coaching, and you sort of touched on it before, when you're coaching um, multi-sport athletes mm-hmm. who are you know, perhaps strength training but they've got maybe a main goal sport, I want to, again, I use a real-life example, a few clients that come to me and their goal is, you know, I want to get big and strong and we might be training for six to 12 months and we're doing really well. And then they sort of say, Hey, I'm really interested in doing, you know, I want to do some fighting. I want, I want to start boxing. I want to do MMA, Muay Thai. I want to do BJJ. Um, one, <laughs> when, when you go to these athletes and I'm sure you do, how are you segregating their training? How are you sort of periodizing that? And how are you prefacing to them that, Hey, if we're going to, the goal is now shifting, um, we have to reduce perhaps a little bit of intensity and volume by strength training. We have yeah. to make sure we're spreading that within fighting because obviously we need recovery. What is, what, one, what does the communication look like within that? Because I know there's a bit of a pushback, especially with me, the guy's like, oh, but I still want to train five days a week yeah. and squat bench and dead like a power lifter. Yeah, at all yeah. times. <laughs> and I find that even though the education's there, it's like, yeah, but you, you do realize you, you, you're going to be fighting as well. Like you can't, you can't do that. Um, right. So perhaps maybe talking about like how you sort of preface that, maybe some metaphors or, or you know, analogies that you use to help get that point across but even also then how you manage that um and again i know it's individualized with an athlete and how you would sort of periodize that up so people are still you know the strength training is complementing the sporting demands and, and obviously recovery side note on that first uh james huffman my husband is actually writing a book on that right now and it's almost done and it's really really interesting i think it will be a really cool read for anyone who coaches multi-sport athletes or any athlete who has to develop various characteristics rather than just one. But um, so what I usually do, so there's a tendency in MMA and BJJ athletes very often 
to be sort of less science-based and more old school, like I'm going to get up and train earlier than my opponent and I'm going to train longer and harder and all these things that don't really make sense for getting better, right? So I think... The Rocky movie. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you just need like five days on a mountaintop with some weights and you're good. Um, Just train for like all the hours. Uh. So the first thing I try to drill into their heads is that you get better when you're recovering. So you know how when you lift weights and you get sore, your deload week when you're actually lifting way less and it feels really easy, that's when your muscles are growing. Not totally physiologically true, but true enough that I feel comfortable saying it and it will support the actual outcome, right? So I try to pound into their head that the rest times are when they actually get better. They break themselves down during the training and the rest times they improve oversimplified but sort of does the trick in terms of communicating what's necessary um and then typically a needs analysis basically like what are your strengths in the sport what are your biggest weaknesses um what could you benefit most from improving on in terms of competition are and first of all are you at the proper weight are you at a good weight are you do you have enough muscle for your weight class um are you less lean than you should be for your weight class and then sort of address any weight changes first so that that's all done and out of the way early on and then go to the you know most needed thing and the needs analysis train that the hardest keep anything else that's weak slowly increasing and put everything else at sort of a maintenance volume and usually need to obviously know the athlete a little bit of history before you know exactly where those volumes are but yeah, just a basic sports needs analysis, um, I think, is the best way to go. Yeah. I think the biggest hurdle with those athletes is convincing them that they need to recover and that they need to train some things less in order to train other things more. I think that's the biggest obstacle. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and well said. I think a really important point, I'm just going to kind of underline that and put it in bold, <laughs> is, um, yeah, right, that recovery. Because, I, well, the first thing is, again, expectations, expectations set by media, movies, things that are popular. Yeah. And then, obviously, actually stating the obvious, you know, we, we don't grow in the gym. You know, uh, the stress and stimuli is generally the adaptation uh, yeah. rather than the actual growth itself. You know, it's like when you get the young kids in the gym, you say, hey, like, see all these weights? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, this destroys muscle. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's I a think, nice entry because it gets their attention. It's good. I like it. <laughs> oh yeah, it just they're like what? It just pikes them up all the time. Because uh, I was I was that kid who was uh, when I first learned to weight train. I was like, well, if I train twice a day, <laughs> right? And then it was like, oh, which which does have its merits. Again, everything's right, right. in context. But um, you know, I was just like, so I always do more and more and more, right? But um. Yeah. More is definitely more, but sometimes by doing less, you can achieve more. And again, yeah. that is a that can be a topical statement. But um, yeah, I really like that you sort of set that expectation with the athlete. And I know that it can be quite hard-headed, especially people with high expectations and high demands. So I think that is really important. And perhaps, yeah, uh, we, we can even link in, um, you know, for, for the book, the upcoming book that James, you know, uh, is writing. Cause I think that would be really, really, I know I'd be interested in that yeah, as I'm starting to coach more athletes. I think it would be great to have a bit of a backbone and a reference to be able to actually sort of base some of that knowledge around and, and those findings, because I, I think a lot of people now are actually, they're, they're becoming like, even again, general population, they're doing multi-sport. Like I speak to a lot of people, you yeah. know, and, and fair enough, why not? You know, they want to do yeah. some strength training, doing some bouldering, BJJ and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, so I think now it's appropriate to springboard into that, which yeah. is talking more about your, you know, experience with martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. First of all, perhaps tell us like how you stumbled across that, how you sort of became passionate with it and sort of wh- where you're at in your journey with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I had a friend who owned a boxing gym. So I got 20 years ago, started boxing and kickboxing just sort of for fun, not really competitively. Mm-hmm. And I did that for several years and they ended up getting jujitsu in the gym. And he kept saying, you you would really like this. You should try it. And I was like, no, I only want to punch things. That's it. <laughs> and finally, one day I tried it and I literally never looked back. I stopped all the kickboxing and boxing classes except for like once a week and just was at jujitsu all the time from there on. And wow. yeah, and it just got, got more obsessed as time went on. I started competing and like 
felt what it felt like to win and try to be in the gym more and more and more. Um, at this point, I am sort of toning things down. I've sort of hit some of the um, bucket list things that I would have wanted in my jiu-jitsu career, um, various competitions and things. So I feel pretty satisfied for someone who had a career the whole time she was training in terms of what I achieved. And I'm 40 and James and I might want to have a family. So I'm kind of like, okay, I can't really be in the gym three times a day anymore. I need to start focusing on like family and career and stuff. But um, I'm still training a lot. I, I love it. I'll never, never stop training until my body stops me. I think yeah. it's, a, it's a great um, intellectual kind of sport. It's sort of a, a marriage of two things I love, like brute aggression and intellectualism together. So it's perfect for me. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a thinker's fighting game. I think a lot of people don't really understand how skillful you have to be until i have a go and it's like i mean it, that could be said for a lot of martial arts i think it's very humbling you know when you actually yeah. even something as basic as boxing uh, you know you, you step in with a box and you sit and you're like oh man i can't even go a minute and how do you hit right. those bags in that <laughs> direction and then you know with bjj grappling so what were some of the the challenges that you faced when you started um, the bjj and how did you manage that with your strength training like can you give us a bit of an idea a picture of what that looked like and what you did and how as you progressed in you know bjj and your sporting demands came higher and you know you started to maybe hit plateaus how you overcame those yeah so when i started jujitsu i actually hadn't weight trained ever i started weight training in uh let's see 2009 i think when um i met mike isretel <laughs> <laughs> He was like, you should go to the gym, lift some weights. And I was like, yeah. And so I started learning um, how to lift weights and yeah. sort of had learning sort of a basic understanding. Um, and he was progressing through his knowledge at the time. So I'd sort of like update my knowledge whenever he visited. Uh, so eventually I kind of knew what I was doing and I made a mistake for several years which was i concentrated on hypertrophy training because i was like i'm lifting to look good but it was um it interfered quite a bit with my jujitsu like doing cuts i even did like a bikini like physique show um and it i realized it was not congruent with my jujitsu and so i started switching to much lower volume strength training um just to make room for all the jujitsu so i tra i would train maybe three times a week more strength rep ranges just to maintain muscle and strength and um, give me a lot more room in my MRV for jujitsu training because for particularly for my size and being a female and um, black belt division, brown black belt divisions um, technique was much more important. I was certainly strong enough to be in those weight classes and what it would come down to for wins was technique. So I needed more time in that. Um, training zone mm -hmm. makes sense and and sort of conversely what are some of the the principles crossovers or lessons in your opinion that sort of each of those disciplines taught you and perhaps did you find that's you know some elements of bjj helped in strength training and vice versa and what perhaps are some key takeaways that can kind of correlate between the two even for people that are interested or even to to, to acknowledge within the two and what might be beneficial to blend um those two elements or those two sporting requirements together yeah for sure so i think jujitsu benefits greatly from doing strength training even even if it's not a huge focus just because there's so much risk of injury <laughs> in jujitsu and having you know the strong ligaments and tendons and things to support your joints is really really important i think almost everyone in jujitsu has blown out their knee and i think if more people squatted there'd be a lot less knee blowouts um still gonna happen it's a combat sport but mm -hmm. it's just hugely beneficial and i think a lot of people don't realize that marcelo garcia who's a really big name in jiu-jitsu once said you know and he's a great guy and a smart fighter but he said don't do anything but jiu-jitsu and i think that that does a disservice for people who are less sort of muscular to start because i think it um, predisposes them to injury in terms of jiu-jitsu helping strength training i don't know maybe it doesn't but 
<laughs> I think it's a lot more fun than going to the gym and lifting weights. Like that's a satisfying thing, but jujitsu is just very, very much more engaging. So I think if you're at a point where you're not competitive with any of your weight training and you're interested in doing something that's going to, you know, contribute to fitness, but also just bring you a lot of joy and intellectual stimulation, jujitsu is a really great sport. And I think that's why a lot of um, people in the sort of strength industry are starting to train jujitsu because they're like, yeah, I go to the gym and I pick things up and put them down, but I'd like something that keeps me up at night, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think mean, like you, you do get to a point where you're lifting and some people lift all their life and they love it, but then you want a bit more and lifting can be very selfish. It's very individualized for the most part. Yeah. Sure. You can train with a friend, but if you're training at a high level, you're sort of getting in there, yeah, you've got your like, own stuff to do. Yeah. Between sets, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, where I think the the cool thing about a martial arts and BJJ, the first thing is is a culture, it is a community. It's a different culture and community. And from what I can ascertain, I we do have um, a, a tutor in our gym as well. It's really great because you know it's good for clients because they can actually go and do this free class. They can get a bit of a you know like a, a taste of it, if you will. Uh -huh. um, and I, it's something I definitely want to give a go. But I do understand as well. I've got to at the moment keep the goal the goal. Um, right. <laughs> when I was younger, I was, I was playing football twice a week. I was training yeah. in the gym and I was doing I, what, I, what was called Sado martial arts. And mm -hmm. I remember um, my, my tutor, Ruben, his name was one of the black belts. And I really looked up to Ruben because he was, um, he was one of those guys where he just moved with so much grace. It was just uh -huh. so, he, he'd reach mastery. You know, everything he did was just so <laughs> crisp. You, you, you've, you've seen yeah. those guys, right? Yeah. And, um, he said to me, Alex, he goes, you know, one thing you've got to keep in mind is if, if you get an injury, everything just grinds to a halt. He says, and if you want to excel at any, any one thing, at some point you've got to commit everything to that one thing if you want to get to that level. Yeah. Um, he says, so just, just keep that in mind. And I think that's one of, sort of the best pieces of advice I got, which now makes a lot more sense, which is not right. to deter people from, you know, doing multiple things. But I just think that if you want to get to an elite level in anything, you do have to just prioritize that that thing, um, and that comes with with pros and cons. I think something else with BJJ is that it puts you in very compromising and um, vulnerable positions, which I don't think the body is used to being in. That's something that I see as as perhaps you know it, it's a benefit, but then perhaps again that's where things blow out depending on who you're fighting. But yeah, I, no, I mean I, that's actually that's a really good point. I think that you're making like it. Sorry, did you you want to finish your sentence? I got excited. No, 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 no. Go for it. I was just gonna say, yeah, please. Like I hadn't like, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think like if you've trained jujitsu for long enough, you and you fail a squat, you will probably dump it effectively just because you are your ability to remain focused and calm in dangerous situations and make good physical decisions is greatly improved by jujitsu especially after several years of training or under your belt mm, mm. so it's kind of like um you know that feeling when you do when you're learning a new movement that's kind of complex and you have no idea like maybe let's say a front roll in a martial art or something like that you have no idea what happened between the point when you reached your arm out and the point when you landed like it's a blur because it's a brand new movement, you don't have the understanding to feel where your body was over that short of a time period and that novel of a situation. But once you've done that a bunch of times and done a bunch of other different 365 degree turns and changes, you know, like in space with your body, you start to be able to be aware of where your body is and where parts of your body are in very fast and sudden situations. And I think that that could be beneficial to lifting, especially if you're grinding through like heavy singles here and there and might need to dump something and save yourself. For sure. I mean, we're so used to in the gym, verting, you know, working through like horizontal vertical planes of motion. It's, I mean, depending on what we do, but you know, main strength training, we're not really putting ourselves through like those different transverse planes or, you know, diagonal ways. And right. it just <laughs> seems that perhaps when you're kind of getting into those positions, to a degree and progressively there could be crossovers. I know um, a pretty popular coach is uh, Nasima, uh, you know, the Nally professor, someone who I really like. He's, he's pretty cool. But I know he's recently, well, not recently, he's been doing it for a while now. You know, he's got into the BJJ and I think it's great when he talks about, you know, that and then the stretching definitely 
amazing. We could talk a lot about stretching. People stretch more, listen, stretch. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously strength training as well and showing that, yeah, you know, there is a crossover, but here are the, you know, here are the, the pros and cons. But like you kind of alluded to, there is that benefit, especially for, I think, conditioning as well. Like you're not just a way to like, it's not an energy dump. It's like, well, yes, I'm expending energy. I'm increasing my fitness, but I'm also doing a lot of other things that are beneficial. And again, it's good for the psyche, right? It's good camaraderie and whatnot. Which I think is great. Um, Mel, I want to I kind of hand the floor over to you in terms of is there anything in particular at the minute that you're really passionate about that you want to share or anything that perhaps we've not really you know, gone into or anything else that we've glossed over where you want to go back and, and perhaps reiterate for, for the people listening? Um, I guess what I'm really into right now that hadn't been a top thing on my list in the past, um, I read about 200 papers on nutrition for health when I was writing a critique of the Game Changers documentary for RP. Mm -hmm. And it was really eye-opening to me. I was pretty familiar, like I had an idea of what was healthy and what, you know, what was good, but I'd never focused on that. I'd focused on, you know, macros, like what kind of digestion properties are better for like my post-training meal and things like that. And after reading of those hundreds of papers, I was like, wow, I should you know, really make a point to get more fruits and vegetables in every day. Uh, I'm sort of famous at RP for being like the worst of the worst at designing meals. Like when I'm cutting, it'll be like string cheese and crackers and almonds on a plate. Like I'm a frat boy. So I've really started to realize like how much of an impact diet can have on longevity. The the statistics and information is is really overwhelming, like in terms of preventing cancer and you know just keeping your heart healthy and living longer and all of these things so i've been a lot more focused on getting a variety of fruits and vegetables in every day on my plate you know like berries and getting my making sure my fats are healthy getting them from avocados and olive oil and things like that um so that's something that's that wasn't at the forefront of my mind because i was so focused on fitness for so long but now that i'm 40 you know it's something i've started thinking about and started focusing on and um it's it's an interesting part of research that I think our industry knows is there and like pays a little mind to, but doesn't focus on. And um, there's no reason not to. It doesn't really, other than a little bit of extra work, it doesn't really impede anything in terms of the body composition or athletic goals with nutrition. So there's no reason not to not to make yourself the least likely to get cancer and the most likely to live long while you're doing all of your athletic endeavors and things like that. Sure. Such, such a thought provoking topic. I think that one, you know, with the evidence based community, especially over the, the past decade, you know, how we can, you, know, you can get shredded on McDonald's and all this carry on. And there's kind of in that shift where it's like, well, no, we're not promoting that, um, you know, energy balance is king. And we've seen, you know, if, if it's your macros come out with some flexible dieting and people, you know, I'm, we've all been there, you know, you lift up your top, I eat ice cream, I'm shredded. Great. Cool. Um, <laughs> and then it's almost like it's gone full circle to, yeah, let's just kind of go back to the basics. Yeah. Like you, you know, whole foods are going to be king. Um, and then there's also that shift between then people, you know, putting themselves in, um, boxes and categories like hey you know i'm vegan or i'm plant-based or i'm pescatarian it's like okay and there's nothing and again the c- keyword is context and uh, i think you'll agree and i'll get your thoughts on this in a, in a moment but you know you've got we can eat food is food i i think you know we shouldn't think about anything in isolation as good and bad and i think if you yeah. can avoid yeah. putting yourself into a box it, it is key and i'm not saying that you know, you, you can't be vegan or vegetarian. I think if you're doing it, great, but definitely do it for ethical principles. I don't think there's any advantage to just eating uh, plants. I think everyone should have a plant-centric diet. And I think, like you said, that's something that you've sort of discovered. It's giving the body what it needs. But I think you are limiting or people are limiting themselves if they say, I'm only going to eat within this category. And the paradox is, and I'll use a, an analogy here, is the typical bodybuilder who eats you know, six meals a day and it's chicken and rice, bro, and a couple of veg. And it's like, well, you know, that might be quote unquote healthy. But the thing is, if you're just eating this small variety of food, you're missing out on all right. of these other nutrients where if you, I mean, per- personally, the person who eats everything and again, in the right quantities and congruence to, you know, moving and sleep and all those basic things is probably at the best advantage to be less deficient in anything because they're getting, you know, 
quote unquote, all the colors, all the varieties, all the vitamins, all the minerals. So, um, yeah. What, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think we're going through a similar process as we did with, um, food for body composition changes. So it started out like you have to eat this way. It has to be clean. That's the only way to lose. And someone was like, no, like you said, you can get ripped eating McDonald's and there's IFYM. This came in and it's like, no, it doesn't matter as long as it fits in this. And I think that, um, we're going through a similar process, but we're a step behind for the eating for nutrition. We're at the point where we're eliminating it. And there's groups that are like, you can only eat this way. This is the only way to be healthy. And I think we'll eventually get to the IFYM of nutrition. Like, no, as long as you're getting the health promoting items in your diet, adding or subtracting the other things isn't necessarily going to make a significant impact. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, for sure. And that was a, is a, it's a controversial uh, documentary and podcast and uh, it spiked <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of work for a lot of people in the industry. And I think that was quite, quite comical in many ways, you know, how yeah. it sort of, it was just <laughs> one documentary and it had sort of multiple sort of um, hooks and leads and then all that sort of rippled. And I thought, well, if anything, now let's give it more exposure. But yeah, I think yeah. people yeah. have, you know, this is the importance of why we, we need to educate people, especially our clients to have this critical thinking, because if you have this sort of uh, way of thinking things from a multifaceted approach and you have some basic education, you're not going to be the hamster on the wheel yeah. and think, I've got to do this latest fad. Right. I mean, even, you know, here in Australia, my clients, yes, it's one of the probably most, you know, it's a bit of a fitness mecca or it's becoming a bit of a fitness mecca from the weather and the demographic. Yeah, but yeah. the even the amount of clients I had who were like, I'm going to go plant-based. And I was like, well, okay, well, why? Because of the game changes. I'm like, okay, don't go plant-based because of something <laughs> you watched on Netflix. Like, please do not. And, you know, the amount of people that, it wasn't like having to talk someone out of it. It was just like, look, if you're going to go vegan or plant-based yeah. do it for these reasons ethically and yeah. know what you're getting yourself into but there's no advantage a lot of those quotes a lot of the evidence was misrepresented i think to say the yeah. least even yeah, though there was truth in there when i started writing it was just supposed to be a blog critique for rp to like send to clients in case they were thinking of going down that road but they didn't have an ethical motivation mm. and i just got so mad watching it turned into a 60 page document it's on the rp site now it's ridiculous oh. i spent so much time but it was beneficial because i learned so much more in detail about healthy eating but um yeah i think that oh i had something else to say what were you saying oh i think the other downside of things like that like some people are saying like why are you you know why are you taking this documentary apart like it's beneficial even if people go vegan you know it'll be good for their health and i think the downside is if you're going vegan which is fairly extreme and kind of hard to manage particularly when you're trying to do cuts and things like that like it's definitely doable you can do it very healthfully but it's harder um i think the downside is people choose that as their means to health and it becomes unsustainable and they give up and go back to old habits and are none the better whereas if they learn some basic principles and just you know added more fruits and vegetables to their plate while continuing to eat meat, they might've had a much easier time and it might've been sustainable. So I think that's the, the downside of things like that. Even if they're at baseline healthy, they're harder. Mm, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because it's almost like that if you are gonna go vegan, vegetarian, you actually do need a little bit more knowledge because you are going to find it more challenging to you know meet your nutrient you know requirements for the day, which again is, is just, very you know paradoxical in terms of what people think <laughs> and i think people who are generally vegan or have been doing it for a while that yeah they're generally they're healthier because they're more health conscious yeah. it's not necessarily because of the food they're eating that has definitely got something to do with it but it's more about those people generally care more about health where you get most people who are just eating everything yeah. they're, they're eating fast food they don't they don't you know they don't have that care factor they don't have that education so and yeah, they lot, end up, uh, vegans thought. end up sort of default adhering to some principles like getting fruits and vegetables and eating whole foods. And that's just sort of happens almost accidentally um, as a part of the diet, which is great if you can do it. But if you can't, you can get those same benefits without uh, eliminating a whole food group. 100%. It's like the, the new term flexitarian, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before, before we wrap up, Mel, let's, um, let's transition into some more rapid fire questions. Okay. I ask all my guests, they're a bit more fun, they're a bit more lighthearted. So whatever yeah. comes to mind first, and all then right. we'll finish off with um, a more serious question, which I ask all my guests. So 
the, the, my first question is, if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? Ooh. Oh, that's hard. I guess I'd want to fly. Let's just fly. (laughs) I was going to say something humanitarian, like being able to heal people, but no, screw it. I want to fly. Yeah. Uh, You you can't beat flying, right? It's it's (laughs) Superman. It's the Matrix. It's Neo. All right. Conversely then, what is your favorite food? So say you've got one last meal that you can eat. What does it look like? It can be um, entree, main drink what's the first thing that like what does mel go to it's like this is this, this is, is my really company easy and you're gonna know why rp shames me for my food choices it would be nachos and candy corn nachos and candy corn i mean right. not together but and oh, plate of nachos and a side of candy corn yeah yeah sweet and sour why not yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that it's different um Okay, what about if you could meet um, anyone, dead or alive, and you'd have dinner with them with your candy corn and nachos? <laughs> who would oh, it that's be? embarrassing. Well, no, can I have a different dinner? <laughs> oh, for sure. You know, or something more eloquent. Hmm. Oh, man. That's a really hard question. Um... They can be dead? Yeah, anybody. I want to meet with Genghis Khan because I've heard, and this is a stupid, unintellectual reason, but I've heard that some of the history suggests that he was redheaded, and I want to know if it's true. There you go. You want to see who is this, the fire, the the true redhead? I want to know if he's a fellow ginger. (laughs) A fellow ginger. Fair enough. Why not? I'm sure you, that would be a very interesting conversation, nonetheless, <laughs> regardless. You know, why did you bring me back from the dead? I just wanted to see if you were ginger. I just wanted to see what color your hair was. <laughs> would you like a nacho? Yeah, would you like a <laughs> That's it. Yeah, quite a, quite a ruthless gentleman um, in, in all accounts and very interesting indeed. And on to my last question, which is a bit more serious in nature. And that is, can you identify a fear in your life? It can be big, can be small. What it was, how you overcame it, and what you learned and took away from that experience. For sure. Um, I used to be terrified to both speak publicly and to fight in competitions. Um, I was really, really shy when I was in college. Like even raising my hand in class, I would turn bright red and regret it instantly and stutter while I talked. And um, I think martial arts are what started getting me over that. The -hmm. experience of being in sort of like awful situations with, you know, huge people on top of you, unable to breathe and like realizing you have to find a way to calm down and that none of this other little, these other little things matter, right? If you say something stupid, it doesn't matter. If you don't win your fight, it doesn't matter. And um, I figured out that when you're scared of something, if you just do it over and over and over again, you stop being afraid of it. So I sort of volunteered to do any kind of talk I could or speak in front of class. I did, I, for a while was competing or fighting like once or twice a month. And I am at the point now where public speaking doesn't even phase me. Competing in jujitsu doesn't phase me. Um, in fact, I got to the point where my problem in jujitsu was that I was too relaxed and I wouldn't sort of get into the fight mode and I'd just play around at the beginning of the match and lose it. So, um, yeah, I think learning that if you just do the things you're scared of over and over and over again, pretty soon you're too relaxed and you have to switch back the other way. Yeah. And it's, it's a cool feeling to know that that can happen when something is so intimidating before. Repeated exposure and desensitization. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting philosophy. I always use the analogy of you know, when you're young and perhaps you go into a nightclub or you go to a new city and it's all, wow, it's like overwhelming. And then at some point, even if you don't expose yourself to that, it's again, it's the public. Right? It's just being yeah. in public. It's being in a different environment. It's being in those difficult situations. It becomes, like you said, a normality. Yeah. And I think um, it's a good point that you make as well, Mel, and to draw kind of a lesson out of that a little bit more is, you know, in, in life, like you said, to do these things it, that make you uncomfortable then sets you up for the future because you can go, well, if I've done this before 
and I've exposed myself to it and now I feel comfortable, this thing that I'm now uncomfortable with, this new thing, well, eventually, if I just keep doing it, right. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And the more I'm uncomfortable now, the less I'll be uncomfortable later. I tell my, like, the younger, younger, the um, lower belt people who are kind of scared to compete, I just always tell them, you're going to die someday. And they're like, what? I'm like, you're going to die, so what does it matter? And they're like, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was part of my process was, like, when I'd be nervous for the competition, I'd be like, someday I'm going to be dead. And then it sort of puts everything else in perspective, like, oh, that's terrifying. This isn't. So. Yeah, it's true. It's actually a really good one. I like that. My, um, I remember my, my dad actually always says that to me. <laughs> um, yeah. Whenever when I, uh, I move. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's, but it's great. And I, I use it now as well. And so I really resonate with that. No, I think it's a great way to just snap people out of it, especially when you're young, you're bulletproof. You don't think about that because you're so far yeah. away. Although yeah. you never know when your number's up. But yeah, I remember him ringing me up when I was in Australia and I was struggling when I first got here and I was out of home for the first time. I was new, I was young, I was like, wow, all these crazy things. And uh, I remember him just saying to me, he rang up one time, he was like, are you dying? I was like, what? He's like, are you dying? And I'm like, no, what do you mean? And he's just like, answer the question, are you dying? I'm like, no, he's like, well, what are you stressing about? And he's like, and even if you were, it wouldn't help. And I was like, and yeah. it's good. it just literally puts everything back yeah, everything in perspective. perspective. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good piece of advice. Um, <laughs> Mel, for, for people who want to find um, yourself, they want to follow along, they want to find more about you, where are the best uh, places, resources, handles to uh, keep up to date? Yeah, uh, my Instagram work account is regressive underload with an underscore between the two words. Um, you can also find me at RP. You can shoot them an email and they'll connect you with me through there. You can DM me on Instagram. Mm-hmm. 100%. And I will, as always, link all those into the show notes below. So for anyone who wants to reach out, please uh, follow along. And I believe you're going to be at the Ultimate Evidence Based Conference later this year in Melbourne. I believe that's in July. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Very excited about that. Yeah, that's, that's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to get down there and, and listen to yourself and a lot of the other speakers. And for anyone listening who doesn't know what that is, I'm going to link it because if you really want to enhance your education, you want to meet some very, very clever, inspirational people in one place, you definitely got to go down and check it out. It's a great time. Um, and I will put all those links in below. So Mel, thank you once again for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was awesome. Absolutely my pleasure. And guys, remember, if you like this, leave a rating and review. It really helps. It takes two minutes. Jump onto iTunes, pop down, tell us what you think, share it with a friend, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube as well if you're listening. Give us a like, subscribe for new videos and podcasts every week. And as always, until next time, stay fearless.